Hey everyone, welcome to NYC++ Meetup. My name is Daniel Katz. I'm a senior software engineer over at Bloomberg and one of the lead organizers of this meetup. If you've made one of our other events in the past, maybe over at MongoDB or NYU, maybe right here at Adobe, thanks so much for coming back. And if this is your first time joining us, then thanks so much for joining us and hope you're enjoying the evening and the food so far. We are continuing our grand tradition of ordering way too much food. We are terrible at estimating this, so please just keep eating because we don't know what to do with it. Uh, <laughs> I always like to start off by thanking our venues for hosting us because uh, it's the reason we can have these events in the first place. Uh, so today I am thanking Adobe for welcoming us back into their offices. Cool, now I don't have to ask for it later. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is the third such event that Adobe is hosting for us. Uh, they hosted us also for our inaugural meetup back in November and had us back here for January. Uh, so it's just awesome to uh, have such a like uh, supportive and consistent and valuable partner for NYC++. And it's wonderful to be back in this space hosting again. So thank you so much, Adobe. Uh, so I've told this story before, but today I'm going to tell it again. It's a little bit more relevant. Uh, this meetup, the idea for NYC++ started sometime last year in Bloomberg Engineering, but more specifically in a meeting with Bloomberg C++ Guild uh, in which Brett Brown, tonight's invited speaker, was talking about how uh, the East Coast of the U.S., kind of like all the way, just didn't have a lot in the way of organized C++. And he was saying, you know, hey, we're in New York, we're all right here in New York, and like New York doesn't even have a C++ meetup. We could do that. And it's like went on with what he was saying, but that point kind of stuck with me. And so after the meeting, I reached out to Brett, and we got talking, and we talked some more, and then reached out to some friends, and we reached out to friends from like uh, Adobe and uh, NVIDIA and Google, including Kristen Shaker, whose birthday is this weekend. Happy birthday, Kristen. <laughs> 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 and everyone was just like, this is an awesome idea. Uh, so we got drinks and we started organizing and uh, now here we are and here you all are. And, you know, we're here because of a lot of hard work, but also because y'all decide to like join us each month for a night of C++ and, and food, we know. Uh, so, you know, we appreciate that. And um, so the purpose of this meetup is to get users of this language together uh, to network, to exchange ideas, to uh, you know, enjoy some great food, and to hear some awesome talks by experts who are at the vanguard of this discipline. And I always like to say that you know, when I say users of C++, that's a huge audience, but that you know, if you're a university student, if you are a boot camp graduate, if you're learning this language for the first time or coming back to it after many years away, and of course, if you're a language lawyer or industry expert who's been using C++ longer than I've been walking, you know, <laughs> just if you're using this language professionally or otherwise, or you have an interest in doing so, you know, this room is the right place for you. Don't second guess it. We're happy you decided to join us. Hope you have enough fun that you come again. So with all that said, tonight we are going to be hearing from Brett Brown, a colleague of mine from Bloomberg, fellow senior software engineer, and the lead of our C++ infrastructure group. Brett is a guy with strong knowledge and strong background, strong opinions about tooling, especially C++ tooling. And so it's small surprise that Brett is very active on the tooling working group of the ISO committee that develops the international language standard. And if you have a chance tonight to talk to Brett for five minutes, then he will convince you that every problem that this language has is in some way reducible to the inadequate story of C++'s uh, package distribution. Uh, <laughs> and he just might be right about that. <laughs> so Brett is going to be giving a talk uh, in May at C++ Now as an invited speaker. Uh, it's a conference in Aspen, Colorado that I myself am also attending, looking forward to. And uh, before I hand off to Brett, I'm going to invite up uh, David Senkel, friend of NYC++, uh, who is also the chair of the Boost Foundation that hosts the C++ Now conference every year. So principal scientist right here at Adobe, or as Sean Baxter would say, professional language opiner, David Senkel. <laughs> Thanks.
Okay, uh, I just want to talk really briefly about C++ Now. This is the world's best C++ conference. There are a lot of conferences, and I'm sure some of them are good. Some of them are really good, but they're not the best. C++ Now is definitely the best. Why? There's a huge focus on interactions and dis in discussions. Like the talks are longer, the periods between the talks are longer. You're talking with, uh, like the second point is like, there's an extreme speaker to attendee ratio. So it's like one speaker for every two attendees. So like you're there and you're in the mix with everything. Um, and a lot of major developments actually happen at the conference because people are discussing, they're interacting and you get to be part of it. Um, so you can really uh, majorly upskill yourself if you go to this conference. Um, I'm not I'm not even trying to like exaggerate it. Um, so this conference coming up, here are some things that, that, that that's gonna be discussed. We've got C++ successor languages, we've got Carbon people coming, we've got CPP front, uh, Herb Sutter's future C++ thing, all kinds of stuff. We're gonna be talking about modules and safety and asynchronous programming, sender receiver, you hear that? There's gonna be talks about that and tutorials. There's uh, C++ coroutines. And who understands coroutines? Raise your hand. Like, <laughs> so you all need to go. Or, I mean, if you go and you don't learn it, then this is just a crappy feature, okay? Um, there's C++ programming with, with artificial intelligence bots. And I kid you not, when I came up with this list, I got to like Wednesday of the conference and it was like, I ran out. I didn't even look at what Thursday and Friday have. Like there's just so much amazing stuff at the conference this year in particular. So you should sign up now, like now, because there's only 40 spots left and they're gonna go away. It's like the last month to sign up. Um, and I'm fairly certain it's gonna sell out. So um, yeah, really sign up now. And for you all, and this won't go in the recording, we'll scrub it. Um, you can get 20% off your normal registration if you use 2023 NYCPP. Now this is the early bird rate, so everybody else gets this until like, I don't know, two days from now, and then the early bird rate ends. But you get this forever, okay? Well, for this year. So <laughs> sign up, search for uh, C++ now on the internet, Use 2023 NYCPP, get your 20% off, and hopefully see a lot of you in Aspen. I know a lot of you are already coming. So that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, David. Thanks for the hype. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for C++ now. I'm really excited. I'm really excited to play hooky from the conference to go rock climbing in Colorado. And I'm definitely going to at least make a talk or two as well. Uh, so Brett Brown. All right, how's it going everybody? Thanks for coming out, thanks for having me. I really love this stuff, so um, yeah, it's great to see everybody like locally, where you could all be friends and like hang out and talk about big things, plan across our organizations to make big impacts, just like they do at C++ now, why not New York City? Everyone's gonna, one of these days, everyone's gonna be talking about the New York City C++ scene and how it changed everything, right? This is the kind of thing that makes that happen. That's really cool, so, um, so here's my talk. I'm Brett, that's how you spell it. Sometimes people put extra T's on it, but that's how I spell it. Um, and you already heard about me, but that's just some bullet points about that. Um, the, talk, the title of the talk is Requirements for a C++ Successor Language. Subtitle might be, nice syntax, can I ship it? Or maybe, how replaceable are C and C++? We'll get into that, right? Uh, first, uh, yeah, it's a bit of an intro to me. I think a lot of this we already hit. Um, I think something I'd like to point out in addition to all that is one, I, as at my role at Bloomberg, we deal with a lot of code. Like we have 30,000 plus C and C++ projects, projects, not files, right? Um, the, and it includes a lot of open source, thousands of open source projects, the ones you all use either at home or in your day jobs, right? So when I talk, it's not, I'm just not talking about our weird special code base, I'm talking about your code base I'm talking about our code base, the worldwide C++ code base. And so when I'm talking about these things, that's what I want everyone to think about, is that it's not just this project, that project, but all these projects now that connect. Second, um, I'm talking about C++, I'm at C++ meetups because I think it's a place to have a big impact because I see a lot of needs that I can maybe help out with. 
but I'm an engineer, so you know, I was writing Python this morning. That, it was a better fit for that role. It's fine. So when I say C++ versus another language, it's not about it's not about like picking favorites. It's not, it's not about red team versus blue team, right? It's very much about like, well, what do our end users need? What do our organizations need? And again, that's organization, whether it's a big company, an open source project, something that someone's trying to string along for another decade without being funded, you know, that kind of thing, right? Um, this is an interesting talk because it can kind of go sideways really quick on the subject. Has anyone, raise your hand if you've seen a flame war about C++ versus another language and which one's better. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid that. So I'm not up here to throw bombs. Um, so priorities of this talk is kind of like how I'm kind of trying to keep it on track and help this be like productive, hopefully. Um, first of all, this is a syntax-free talk. I'm not gonna talk about curly braces or indentation patterns or whether your declaration of your type is on the left or the right-hand side of the variable, that sort of stuff, right? Um, the, for, and for the sake of discussion, this is, a, this is a way to reason about things. I'm gonna grant that at least one language can check all the boxes listed there. They'll have a better safety story maybe, whatever safety means. Um, they'll have better language design, whatever that means. Um, they'll be mature enough to actually be worth adopting for the newer projects, that sort of thing. And for some people, this is already true. There are projects picking different languages, right? And that's okay. But for the sake of this, let's just grant that something will figure out that some state in 100 years or something, right? Um, and I will be considering C and C++ as kind of a group. C slash C++ is not a language. Don't put that on your resume. You'll get angry people on the internet about you not knowing what you're talking about. But for the purpose of this discussion, the ecosystems overlap a lot, and the use cases overlap a lot, at least to the ones I want to point out. So I'm going to treat them together, right? If I think there's a distinction, I will try to be clear about that. Call me maybe in the hallway track, like after this talk, if you think I'm being unfair, and I'll try to amend my slides, but I don't think you'll, I don't, I don't think you'll have that problem. Um, Another challenge with this talk is what is a successor language? And to some degree, that's part of the thesis is that we need to figure out what that we mean when we, when we say that. So as I read a lot of people's thoughts about this, as I discuss things in the hallway, it comes up that there's a, several different things people mean. So they might mean, I want to just research cool language design about systems programming, resource intensive languages. And there are languages that already claim to be this that are in the, the C++ successor bucket, right? Um, another one is people are like, well, I just want something else sometimes, at least on some projects, I don't want to write C++. I want a systems language, but yeah, a different one, right? And then sometimes people mean, and this is, this is partly why we need to have this discussion now, is they want a different language. They don't want C and C++ anymore. They have specific reasons, specific experiences that say, no, not that. Anything but that, I want the next thing that's better, right? And those are all different ideas, and you do different things and engineer different solutions depending on what you're trying to do there, all right? Um, okay, so that's the parameters, that's it. I'm gonna try to keep on, on a good pace here. So to that last pull-up point, let me blow it up a little bit. Um, it's kind of new that divestment from C++ is, is, is such a zeitgeist, such a topic of conversation. We've actually had successor languages for a while. Languages for a while. What's new is like how much certain people want to you know, just get out of the business. So, and that makes it challenging to discuss. So this is the elephant, the C++ elephant. Raise your hand if you've seen a talk where someone talked about the blind philosophers and the ele elephant, no? All right, there's a parable, right? There's a parable about blind philosophers and they're all looking at an elephant and they're feeling around and they all have different impressions of what they're looking at, right? Some people think it's a serpent. Some people think it's a, a tree trunk. Some people think it's a wall, right? And because it's all, they're not, they're not seeing the whole picture, they're getting their view of things. And it, C++ has been related to this because it is so many things to so many people that everyone comes away with a little bit of a different impression. And that makes it hard to talk about these problems, right? Because people say, C++ is horrible, I don't like the compiler error messages, or C++ is horrible, uh, I, it's not safe like I want it to be. Or C++ is great, I can do whatever I want it to. Or C++ is great, I can get the compiler to complain why to do something wrong, right? If, I, if I'm clever enough, right? So the point is, it makes it hard to talk about this, so let's have a little bit of leeway. Sometimes when we're discussing things, it's gonna be, sharing experiences and understanding that different people have different needs, right? But more recently, some people have the same problem on the criticism of C++ side, right? They want, they see an elephant, but it's an evil elephant that will kill you, right? And they all have different perspectives on why that is, right? They all see an evil elephant, right? So that makes it hard to 
discuss with them, okay, what are you trying to do? What would fit your needs? What fits the needs? What would address your concerns? Because everyone's coming from a different set of criticisms as well, because C++ is so many things, right? Um, so just so you know, I'm not making stuff up. I picked up a pullout quote just to illustrate that I'm not just you know, addressing arbitrary people. There is a, someone who is, a, I guess, a professional language of pioneer. I guess I am one now, too, because I have a talk. So maybe I'm a scientist. Um, his name's Alex Gaynor. He's actually been involved in the Python Foundation and some other important projects like that. And among other things he said is, quote, um, C++ is to the peril of hospitals, human rights, dissidents, and health policy experts. It is, quote, bad for society, bad for your reputation, and bad for your customers. So these are the kinds of things that are actually said. And they're said, and he's addressing, by the way, in this article, the title of the article is, Introduction to Memory and Safety for VPs of Engineering. So he's trying to talk to the person that's controlling the budgets and the strategic direction of the technologies for your companies and for the open source projects they contribute to. Does that make sense? So to some degree, this talk is trying to like, well, let's talk about that. Let's say you feel this way. What next? What's the thing we should think about next, right? So in brief, this is just the, you know, I'm saying we should think about adoption velocity a lot more we should be concerned about adoption friction a lot more, right? If, if that's where we want to go. If, if, whether that's, I want it's more of my projects to be in C++, or I'm, if I want more of my projects to be in a new language or a new paradigm, or if I want to get literally all the projects or even just all the important projects onto, onto something new, these are things you're going to have to really focus on. And I'm going to elaborate on what I mean by that. Um, and it's worth noting that even if you're not interested in any of this at all, these principles I'm talking about apply to other things you already do. It applies to, uh, you know, maybe you want to do a new package management system for your code base, right? Maybe you want to do adopt a mono repo in your organization. Maybe you think C++ syntax is horrible and you have a better idea for how to make a better syntax for C++. For C++ I mean, sorry, CMake, anything, right? Anything that's like I need to systemically change something about my code base. This is very. These these are just principles you can use anywhere. So hopefully. You, there's some things to think about. We can, we can engage about that and what that means to you, right? So starting one, first, first principle, first requirement is supporting existing ecosystems. Let's back up a little bit. What do I mean by ecosystems? And what, do I, what does that mean to C++? C++ has, what does that mean? So like C++ we talk about is a systems language. It's really core to what it is. It can like really get down and dirty in the metal, right? There's a lot of languages kind of in that space, and here's a bunch, right? Some of these I've written. A lot of these I've written, at least in, in passing. Go, I put Go in the list intentionally. If, if you say Go is an alternative to C++, a lot of people are like, hey, it has a garbage collector, you know? Um, but it's true that, you know, some people, they write projects in Go that they might have written in C++ before, or maybe they've rewritten some C or C++ projects into Go. So to that degree, it is, it is an alternative. And to the extent that they need a certain amount of access to a certain amount of hardware or, or something low level, Go meets their needs. So it's relevant, right? It's, is it a, but it's a good point that they're not the same. So what, what, so why are they not the same? Um, so yeah, broadly speaking, like I said, uh, this is, Will Crichton is in the Rust projects. He's talking about system languages and he's kind of echoing what I'm saying. Um, you could distinguish maybe systems language in terms of their level of abstraction from the machine, whatever that means, meaning like you could really just drop down and touch the raw bits or whatever if you really need to, right? Um, the, there's something else though about ecosystems, like about systems languages and ecosystems. To some degree, the job of systems languages is to do what you need it to do where you need to do it, right? So like, no matter where you're writing code, no matter what language or what framework or what job you're trying to do, there comes a time when something needs to get down in there and interact with the EPOL system or something very fundamental to the project you're working on, right? And that's one of the things that systems languages really shine at. Does that make sense? Are you following me when I say that? So you might be an all Python shop, but I promise you, you're gonna hit a point where you're like, well, Python's not cutting it, I need to drop down to something more powerful. And that is where C and C++ really jump out and stand out right now. Because, because it's been done so far, it works so far, and people know how to, throughout whatever, no matter what the pain levels are, they can get in there and be like, okay, well, I'll just write TensorFlow and C++ and it'll be that much faster and yada, 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 right? Um, and so 
that's why C++ doesn't have a package manager. It kind of has all the package managers. And that's why it's kind of haphazard and confusing about how to go ahead and package things. Because you are thinking about, I'm writing a C++ project, how do I ship it? You know, and the answer is, I don't know, Where are you, who needs it, right? So, and I'm taking a broad view of ecosystems that actually does include things like build systems. Like if your users need your dependency to work in a build system that they use, that's something you have to you have to factor in. It doesn't matter what the syntax of the language is. What matters is they need to be able to use you as a dependency at a practical level, right? Um, and interestingly, as a property of C and C++, there is no like steering committee, not really. I mean, we could talk about ISO and the hallway and what that means, but it's not really set up to tell you what C++ is and isn't, not as an ecosystem. So if you, in, if you in your basement write a new C++ compiler and it gets to sufficient level of popularity, you're de facto included in C++. And you can go to ISO meetings and say, oh, I have an implementation, don't do that, you'll break me, and that will carry a lot of weight. So it's kind of a decentralized governance mechanism. So, and interestingly, because of this decentralized governance mechanism, it is actually very good at going to where you need it and, fit, and meeting those systems language problems that you need in those spaces. Does that make sense? Like, it doesn't matter what kind of weird chip you are on, what kind of weird build system you are, you could probably figure out how to get to build C code, even if it's a little hacky, right? Whereas some alternatives don't really work that way. Um, and if you want more elaboration on any of these points, let's hit that in the Q&A, because there's a lot to get through, but um, there's, there's some elaboration, right? S sufficiently important ecosystems include the way people build the projects that they're gonna depend on, right? So that means if you have, if you wanna replace if your code with the next best thing, you should probably support CMake. You should probably support, depending on how important those projects are, if you want, to, you want curl to be safe, if you want open SSL to be safe, you probably need to support configure and make. And, and that's really important. Like those projects are not gonna take your safety route if they have to break all their downstream users because they just broke the, the way the builds happen. And that's not something that's not gonna come up in your abstract syntax tree or your, your clang parser. Does that make sense? And that is what C and C++ are. They are the languages that work with configure and make. And there are very few languages that even try to get in that space. In fact, they actively avoid it for good reason. But what that comes back to what is a successor language then, right? Don't make projects choose what to support. And that goes more for architectures and operating systems. Yeah, there's a lot of weird endianesses and bit sizes and things like that. I'm not saying every project needs to support ever, every one of them. But if you don't support something that's important to certain fun, like very popular, widely used projects, it's just gonna be out of scope for them. Again, like projects like, I don't know, libyaml or something like that, right? Like if they already ship to, you know, 38-bit CPUs or something like that, and they don't, and it's really important to them that they don't drop that support. It doesn't matter that your safe language, your safe language is irrelevant unless you're willing to somehow meet them at least halfway and getting there, right? Um, similarly, build rules. Like, and then I just picked this: supporting building against pre-built binaries. A lot of newer languages are actively avoiding that. Understandably, it causes a lot of complications with how you manage dependencies. And yet, it is something that certain companies that I might be at standing in right now, like do as part of their business model in certain ways, right? And it's something that like my company uses pre-built binaries in certain cases. And there's government, there's government systems that are safety critical or performance critical or, or secret in some way. And it's very important to them that they can ship a pre-built binary, right? Um, and it's not about even like, could I change all the code? Like you would have to change the literally the business model or the deployment model of the whole code base, that's even harder, right? Like, like you have to get all your users to be willing to accept code in a new way, even if they're like, even if they're the ones that are still on C++ 98 or something like that, right? So these are all, I'm just elaborating, this is, this is all adoption friction. Like, so you can pick what you want, but just don't expect to have the velocity you need to make a difference in the next, I don't know, couple of decades or something. Right, especially on the most important, most popular projects. Um, and just as an example, this is Daniel Stenberg. He's uh, the lead, as far as I can tell, the lead maintainer of the curl project. They just had a big 20th anniversary, so good, good for them. That's a great project. It's done a lot of, provide a lot of value for a lot of people. Really important to, to the maintenance of the curl project is 
things that worked in curl 15 years ago still work like that today, the same way. And this is an article about why is curl still written in C? Because believe it or not, random people email the curl developers saying, why haven't you rewritten this in the next language yet? It's way better, right? And this is, this is the response he gives. Because he's like, look, and he's kind of in effect saying, I need to support configure and make. And I need to support these platforms that you don't think are important. So I can't, you, he, says, he says in his articles, feel free to fork me, write a better curl, that's fine, but this project is targeting that, right? Next principle requirement is uh, supporting incremental change. This is, this is pretty interesting, I think, because we, we hit this a lot at, my, at our code base. Um, ideally, and this is a, a phrase I, I'm borrowing from Sean Baxter in some talks he's given recently, ideally we'll have like little bubbles of code, like little bubbles. Like, because this, this whole ecosystem is kind of bubbly already, right? Like they have this weird CPU and they have this weird build system. So ideally, like, you could also be bubbly about the way you deploy these changes. So that bubble can be slow to adopt. This bubble could be fast to adopt. Does that make sense? Um, so there's a spectrum, and it's not strictly a spectrum if you want to be scientific about it, but you know, there's, there's various granularities down to like which lines of code should be the new thing versus like entire, you know, the entire code base for your entire company, right, from scratch, right? And there's like various levels in the middle. And ideally, you want to be as close to the granular bubble as possible. Um, so this is a broader principle. I've said like these principles apply other places. Like if you're trying to switch version control, if you're trying to do, uh, you know, like everyone knows, like, well, everyone doesn't know. Maybe you don't know. Uh, it, it seems like a, like a software engineering principle that you don't want long-lived branches when you're making, a big, making changes in your code base. You want to merge them qu quicker, quicker. It's easier to digest. You get better velocity and that sort of thing. Similarly, with code reviews, you don't want to give someone like 8,000 lines of code to look at. You want to give them a series of smaller changes so that they can keep up and get more meaningful review. Similarly, agile principles, methodologies aside, say it's really great to go always be showing your customer where you're up to so you get really good feedback loops. And similar things here. Um, so look at these graphs, these charts, these excellent graphs I made in, in, in slide pre Slideware presentation software. Um, are kind of illustrating that. So on the left-hand side, we have a very smooth graph. And it's not really smooth. If you get up close, there's pixels, right? So it's, it's actually kind of jagged, but they're small. So you, it's nice and smooth. You can always see where the next step is. You're like, oh, okay, well, I can go that much further next time I get a little piece, of, a little chance to advance. Whereas on the right hand, the right, our, the right diagram here is you're not seeing an adoption curve, you're seeing adoption cliffs. And you run right into those face first, right? And those are the things like, it's going along great. And then I hit libcurl. Right, that kind of thing. Make sense? So ideally, you could like, okay, well, skip libcurl. I'm moving on, right? And we'll come back to that. Like, and, th and that's what you really want to shoot for. Um, and just you know, Titus has similar thoughts. I don't think he's applied it in this context, but maybe he'd agree with me. I was hoping he'd be here. I could actually actually just ask him, but I'll, I'll, I'll I'm sure I'll find out some other time. But he's talking about he has a lot of good great talks about uh, refactoring your C++ code bases, your C code bases with automated tools, and he says. Um, execute a large distributed change in a series of steps such that the ecosystem continues to build and function clearly at every step, right? But each step is small enough to be handled as a part of a normal developer workflow, meaning the rest of the world's going on while you're rewriting all this stuff. You don't want to get in the way. You don't want to say, oh, you were going to ship that bug fix. No, you have to wait three weeks because I'm in the middle of rewriting everything at this layer. And that's not acceptable, right? For a lot of business cases, it's absolutely not acceptable. Right, so there, you know, you can take a picture if you want the YouTube link or whatever. Um, I'm sure we'll share the slides. Um, it's a great talk. I think I'll refer to it again later. Um, next principle requirement is supporting unordered adoption. It's similar but different. Um, again, Titus says um, if you're going to refactor, if you could do it in such a way that when you're updating callers, you don't have dependencies of which of them get updated first, right? To a lot to so let's, let's show some diagrams to help you understand what I mean by that. So thought experiment, option A and option B. And option A, in parallel with whatever parallelism you can muster, you're just going to mark arbitrary nodes. Option B, um, with whatever parallelism you're going to muster, you're going to mark only the nodes whose dependencies are already marked. Now, who likes option A? Okay. Nobody likes option Who likes option B? All right, I, I think we've got about even, even odds here. So let me explain it more. <laughs> The problem is, if you go from bottom to top, or top to bottom, it's how many, t how many iterations you have to do. Does it make sense? So let's, let's just pretend we're going this way. If you have five workers, 
and you're going this way, you know, most of them are going to be late, not operating at this level, right? You're going to have one worker working on this one, while four are waiting for more work. And then when that's done, you're going to have two workers working on these and three idle, right? And, and they, they advance a little bit more, and this and this might get unblocked, right? And still, two workers are working, yada, yada, yada. It's actually really slow throughput. If you, if, if, you, if you assume that each of these nodes takes, let's say, two weeks to adopt, which is actually pretty aggressive for these kinds of changes, um, you're looking at that basically the height of the graph given maximum parallelism, which in this case is, I think, about six or seven. So you're saying six or seven times two, which would be about 12 to 14 weeks. Whereas if you had even reasonable amounts of parallelism, you just divide the number of nodes by the parallelism. So I have what? We go up to O, is that like 20? So if you have like a parallelism of five, that would be eight weeks. That would be four, there'd be, yeah, there'd be eight weeks to get that all done. So that's twice the velocity just because you can unorder adoption, adopt the nodes. Does that make sense? All right. And these nodes, the granularity doesn't matter. It goes back to the first thing I said about as small as possible, right? Um, so, you know, the bigger the nodes, the bigger the risk because you're talking about bigger amounts of work to wait for until you get unblocked. So ideally, this is like file by file or even function by function if you can, but it could be as coarse as like repo by repo or project by project, right? And I guess what I'm saying is language designers included, you have to consider this when you're talking about what your language is gonna be good at. Good at. Um, so realistically, Brett, that looks complicated. My project's really simple. I only have like two dependencies and so it's not my problem, right? Well, okay, let's talk about realistic examples. This right here is the graph of the dependencies if you want to build them from source. Vim's, Vim's a pretty powerful project. It's not the particularly complicated though. Things, there are nodes on here that might surprise you, like you would need a Perl. Um, you would need like a get text and you'd need like things like end curses. If you don't know what those are, they're just very pop, the kind of projects that should be converting to the new language according to the people that think you should convert, right? Um, I didn't bother marking the notes because it would not be legible, but it, hopefully it's illustrating things pretty well. More realistically, this is a real backend C++ service at Bloomberg. And again, I anonymized it for slightly different reasons, but it's not a particularly the complicated one for us. It looks like something out of a Petri dish, right? And the point is like, if you're, again, if you're going, think back to this, like, think back to this slide. If we're marking nodes on this and we're doing one layer at a time, how many years is it going to take? Are we designing for this when we talk about new languages? When we tell people, why aren't you adopting the new language yet? Are we factoring this into our discussions? So it's, just, and you know, again, even if the, the, you know, even if you're saying, well, let's only look, think about important projects. Well, what does that mean, right? So what projects can convert? Is it, is it only the ones at the bottom of the stack? What if the most important projects in the middle? We're still blocked, right? It doesn't matter if it's better, it doesn't matter if it's safer, it doesn't matter if it's more productive, it doesn't matter if the developer experience is, way, is much better. If, if it's blocked, it's blocked, right? Um, and that's getting out the developer experience, right? So the, there's a lot of bullet points on this slide, I know, but there's a lot to consider. Um, I, you know, if you wanna take a picture, that's fine, you can read through it later, but it's actually a big piece of adoption friction, a really practical one. When you ask people to, to switch to something new, if it breaks like significant things about the way they do their work. That includes things like, well, my project has standards about the quality, and we have certain tools in place to make sure we meet our quality standards. And if I have to turn that off to convert to your thing and then turn it back on after the, the, after the conversion's done, that's a big deal for me. I don't want that. I want the, I want the quality to stay high throughout the entire migration. Maybe some projects, it's really important that they have API docs. So if you have two languages implementing each other, like supporting each other and implementing a full project, what do the API docs look like? So if, you're in the, if you have your new Foo language, you're like, hey, it's great. We have this Foo doc system. It dumps it all to you know, GitHub pages, yada, yada, yada. Great, right? What happens, with the, but does it support that C and C++ code that you're still converting? No. Well, oh, why would I do that? I'm like, okay. But you know, there's going to be projects that are like, well, I can't adopt that because my customers need these API docs, and I can't not support that. Um, same thing for foundational libraries within different code bases. Does your feature flag system, is it going to be able to operate with both languages at the same time? Right? 
is your is you know that's really important. And and it's not just a point a point about memory models or object models or whether the linkage between the languages work together. It's a very practical concern about well, I need one and only one thing telling me the the bit is on for I'm I'm doing this kind of code. I'm hitting this code path or this code path. And if it's if that bit is split between two like language ideas of what a uniqueness is of an object, then it's a really big deal. It's, it's a really practically big deal. It's really enough to kill the, pro the conversion project altogether. It only takes one or two, often sometimes just one subsystem that has that problem. All right, so more practical examples. I'm told this is the better part of my talk, so hopefully uh, this makes sense to you. Um, we at Bloomberg have done these things. We do these things quite a bit. One of the better examples that's easy to explain is we've recently revamped our build systems. Very recently, I mean over the last, you know, well, you'll see. Um, our legacy system is was a GNU-based GNU kind of make file build framework system. Um, it wasn't great. There's some, you know, I'll list some adjectives that describe in different ways why it wasn't great. Um, and then we, you know, kind of organically through our community and the guild that, that Dan was mentioning earlier, we came up with some new ideas on how we can revamp it. Um, it's a new system using CMake Modern, CMake Principles, uh, much better developer experience, like, like not even close, like orders of magnitude better, um, much more feature rich, much more extensible, much more co contributor friendly. Um, the adoption velocity was this. So uh, over the course of about five years, we converted 17 and a half thousand projects. And that's at the rate of about 30, 325 projects a month. So that's realistic for something that's relatively easy to adopt, right? Um, Importantly, this is all self-paced adoption, so it's going to look a lot like what you might see in the wild at a very, uh, for at least important open source projects and that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Um, they're self-paced. There wasn't, the CTO didn't go around and knock heads because you didn't use the new build system. I know some build system conversions look like that. That's not what we did. That's just not the way Bloomberg works for the most part, right? The, the carrots mentioned here, and the pain points that pre-existed were more than enough to convince people that, yeah, okay, I should take a look at that when I get a chance. And importantly, because we didn't have ordered adoption, we didn't have, you could, you could migrate in more gradual ways, they could actually fit their conversions around their schedules and make what makes sense for their normal development workflows, right? They didn't have to stop servicing the customer for a month while they did the build system conversion, that sort of thing. Um, Importantly, complicated projects can be converted gradually. You could add the new CMake support to the project over time without dropping support for the old build system and then kind of flip over to the new one when it's ready, like have parallel CI runs set up where they're both like checking each other's work and make sure nothing breaks, that sort of thing. Um, importantly, for these kinds of things, and it's relevant in this context too, is that like we actively encouraged extensible systems where people can self-service if they have blockers or needs. You don't want, like you don't want issues in the core team backlog and everyone's sitting around waiting for those to get pulled off the backlog and fixed before they decide to take the new thing, right? And that goes for these things too. So well, if we have like a language ecosystem and it's centrally controlled and it's not extensible for a new language, that's gonna be a really big problem because it's like, well, I need support for exotic architecture. I need support for, I need to shell out to CMake sometimes so I can build this dependency. I feel like, well, no, put it, put it in the issue tracker. We'll get to it later or, you know, that's gonna be, you know, a death for that kind of adoption. It could be an, delay an already complicated migration years or something, right? Ideally, you want everyone, the second they have a chance to say, okay, I have, my boss isn't looking. I got three days. Let's get this thing going, right? That's really what you want to shoot for. Um, and we spent a lot of non-technical investment. I know some of the C++ successor communities are really excited about this. And I think we, you should be excited about this too if you want to make big changes in your organizations. Non-technical investment is very undervalued community bootstrapping, like make sure you have places for people to go and talk about these things, you know, have great, great documentation, host workshops, um, actually foster um, like local expertise, meaning like develop mentor people so that they can answer the questions when you're not paying attention, that sort of thing, right? So how, let's reflect, relate to build systems back in a very concrete way. This relates back to like, what do we do about the future of C++, right? A lot of these successor languages, they kind of come with their own build packaging systems, right? Some of them are, it's like, well, theoretically you could like, yeah, but nobody does. So it doesn't really matter, right? Um, in those cases, you are doing everything I just talked about as the table stakes to start writing the new code. 
right? So for a non-trivial code base, the worldwide code base, you're talking years to get ready to start converting things to the new ecosystem. And I think the technology coming out of these languages is really cool, it's really inspiring. I'd love to see these things for everybody in the whole world, no matter what language they're writing. But realistically, if we need everyone to convert to your tool chain before they can start writing your language, again, you're gonna have some impact, but it's not gonna really dis displace everything. And so we're talking about the different kinds of successors. There are gonna be some of those kinds and not the others, right? And it's definitely gonna be a concern for everyone that thinks one of these solutions will solve all the safety problems for the world in a reasonable amount of time, right? Um, let's, let's draw some more implications from here. Um, let's just recap, again, recap. We wanna support existing ecosystems. We want incremental change. We want unordered adoption. And we want to consider the whole development expanse, right? The, um, and this is not an exhaustive list. These are just big ones that are easy to describe and talk to people about, right? Um, and, you know, I think aspiring languages are great. Like, if that's not clear from what I've been saying this whole time. So, you know, if you like your language, go for it. If you can use it, use it. Um, just let's be careful, maybe, about how we describe things, right? So is it a C++ successor? Like, maybe you can't do all, check all the boxes with your favorite thing, right? That's okay. Maybe it's just an alternative. And, and maybe that's good. There's nothing wrong with being an alternative, right? Maybe should, but should the rest of us be a little more careful about the word successor and successor language. Because some people hear, well, it's the thing that's gonna, it's the version three. I want the new version, right? That's the thing I should be shooting for. When, when, if they're gonna coincide and stick around together for a long time, that's a different calculus that people are gonna have about whether something gets adopted and when, right? And this is a slide from Chenek Ruth, uh, debuted the carbon language at C++ North last year. And this is a slide from his deck describing uh, analogy, analogies, analogies, analogies to other like languages that were like improvements on other languages. And the way he's using successor, given these kinds of slides, means um, next, but I guess not really replacing because none of these really replaced the thing that they came after, did they? There's still C code. Bjarne loves to complain, and he's right that there's a lot of C code in if people write C++, C code in C++, and they shouldn't do that anymore because there's better things to do. So, so we're kind of like, yeah, people are still writing C, right, whether they should or not. Um, you know, there's still a lot of JavaScript out there. It's not going it's not going anywhere. There's a lot of more TypeScript. It's growing, right? But it's not like the JavaScript's getting smaller by any means, right? Um, so if we put the successor, if C++ is on the left hand side of some of these arrows, and some new languages on the right hand side, is it going to be like this? Realistically, yes. So anyone that's really worried in the category of you know, let's replace C++, we get rid of C++, it's end of life deprecated. You have a pretty big uphill battle, especially factoring in the things I'm talking about in this talk, right? So how replaceable are C and C++? They're kind of irreplaceable in some ways, aren't they? And like, maybe you love C++ and that's in the good sense. Maybe you hate C++ and that's in the bad sense. But in, the, in both senses, I think we have some common ground, right? Um, I'll get to that. It's, it's worth noting it's even hard to replace C++ with modular C++. Well, for one, you know, there's still a lot of work to do to make it practically usable. It's very relevant to everything I'm saying right now, right? But um, like if, if C++ is the best language in the world at interoperating with other C++ projects and we have a hard time displacing C++, then how much worse is it gonna be for the next system? Right, so we should probably be realistic about this. Um, let's be careful about straw manning each other about like when people have reservations about this, I think these are very concrete, very dispassionate, very technical things to talk about. It's not about like, I hate C++, I, I love C++ and then like my livelihood depends on it or something like that, right? It's very much like, okay, well these are problems and I don't see solutions yet, so what are we gonna do, right? Um, and maybe C++ deserves a little bit of a break because maybe these aren't C++ problems, maybe they're system, systems language problems, the fact that you have all these ecosystems and they overlap and interconnect and something needs to be there for those, those situations to say, okay, now I need to really hard code this memory address because I'm doing a driver. And you know, that thing needs to be portable to all these weird architectures. Like that's a thing that a systems language does, right? And C++ has some really big words, partly just indirectly, but directly, indirectly, but in a, in a very concrete chain that does not have silly links in it, like, connected to the fact that it's the system's language. So if you're wanting to display C++ in the sense of deprecate C++, you're gonna be having to take some of these use cases on. And I think that's a challenge that a lot of new languages don't wanna get into for really good reasons, and I agree with them, 
but it's also not a recipe for displacement, right? Um, yeah, so I also wanted to just move our discussions a little beyond syntax. I find when we talk about these new languages, there's like five threads about, I don't like the curly brace placement, and why didn't you use Pascal case for the declare, uh, okay, I don't care, right? So if you notice, I didn't talk about any of this in this talk, um, because there's so many problems we're just not talking about as a group, and I would think we really need to. And, um, and to some degree, like I said, picking one ecosystem like limits the impact of, of a systems language or tool. Um, you need to be, there is a, so anyway, we should, I think there's positive steps we can take though, like make C++ more replaceable. I think that's good for everybody, whether you like C++ or not. If you love C++ and think the next 20 years look like better C++, you want to be able to replace the old C++ with the new C++, right? And whether you want to get rid of C++ and replace it with a different language entirely, same thing. So if C++ isn't that replaceable, maybe we should focus on things that make it more replaceable. So concretely, what do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot to work on, but some next steps that I think are very realistic. We should be able to define what a library is for a system language. Surprisingly or not, maybe to you all, there is no thing saying this is what a library is. There are libraries, they clearly exist, but nothing like defines how you would describe one to a human or to a machine. It's just, well, that's a library. I called it a library, so it's a library. And that's where like header only comes into play. What does header only mean? Like how do you, like it still has, maybe it still has dependencies, but headers don't describe dependencies. Not really, they just have other textual inclusions. Like where do those come from? Well, they're on the system, I guess, when, or had, had, they're on the system when you ran the compiler, but where did that, where did, how, why are they on the system? Well, somebody installed it yesterday. Well, that's weird, okay. Um, like these things, like we could, we could define these better, right? So like header only probably needs to go away. It should be header plus metadata, always, that kind of thing. Make sense? Um, similarly, at the bottom layer of the stack that we can build on, we should probably start talking about how do we define standard ways to do for tool chain assumptions. Um, this is relevant like if you had package managers that wanted to cooperate and have compatible build flags, there should be a standard way for all of them to say, okay, on this system for this build, what are the ABI flags that everybody has to be consistent about? Right now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, a lot of this is just literally hard-coded in every project in the entire stack. And if you look at that big amoeba-looking graph thing, every one of those has to get those flags right or you get crashes in production or something. And it doesn't matter what language you're writing it in because all of them have to get the flags right because nothing knows how to say, well, make sure the amoeba is all the same color blue or something. Like, there's no tool for that. But let's, these are the things we can start with, right? Um, and, you know, finally, I think the world needs cross-ecosystem systems languages. I think. Like Bryce has a really good talk a couple years ago about uh, what is C++ and what fits in the standard library. And he's, he came up with this word universality, which kind of rang, rang really strongly with me. The idea like C++, what it is there for all of you in all these different circumstances. And it's okay, I think, for other languages to say universality, not for me, that's fine. But something needs to be in that space. Like you need, curl needs to be at all those places, right? Doesn't matter if you're embedded, doesn't matter if you're the biggest supercomputer, doesn't matter if you're most standard container image, it doesn't matter if you're web, web assembly, you need things that work all those places. And for you to say, well, I'm not gonna target that part because only 5% of people care. Well, yeah, but those 5% include the most important things that have the most security implications and the most scale, right? So those are my thoughts. Uh, I would love to talk to you about like what you have thoughts on or concerns about, that sort of thing. Uh, any, oh yeah, Tucker Bloomberg, uh, we're hiring. So if you're interested or you're looking for a job, let us you know reach out. Uh, any questions, concerns, comments? <laughs> I think we'll have the slides out linked somewhere. I've got a bunch of references in case you want to have more to read up on. Um, yeah. Anyway. Give me the mic. On your mig on your migration from uh, make uh, from C make uh, I'm sorry make to C make mm -hmm. uh, were you able to write any tools to uh, semi automate the process? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Yeah, so there were a lot of things we did. Um, interestingly, we actually had to go back to the old legacy system and add some features that made it map to the new system in more uh, obvious ways. 
like to make certain things easier, like certain con conceptual things to line up a little bit better, especially around dependency declarations. Um, so that's one thing we did. And we shared tools between both ecosystems and like, well, what are my dependent, actually, what are my dependencies so I can get them right? And that's something we kind of needed anyway. Uh, we had some tools that um, we did, some cases we couldn't automate the conversion, but we picked something that was always correct by virtue of using the new build system. We did, this is something they didn't need to specify anymore. It was just like, like CI systems and packaging systems. You could just say, well, because CMake's better, just say it's a CMake project and it'll figure it out. So that was a kind of an automation that, in, in the sense that you didn't have to do something anymore. You just kind of deleted logic you didn't need anymore. But we did have, again, bottoms up community driven conversion tools. Um, a few were 100% automatable, depending on the structure. Like certain projects had higher governance levels, so you're, it was possible to say, I know everything about this project because it's so simple or so straightforward. Here's the CMake you want, and they would dump into it. Um, in other cases, it's really hard. It ended up being more like a long tail because make like a lot of languages is like Turing complete. You could be doing all kinds of weird stuff at the end of the day if you really want to, and it's hard to parse unless you just run it and make like. But that's hard to do depending on what the, because you know if the project's on non-standard, how do you run it? So, uh, but we did come up with 80% tools is what I like to call it. Like you could, it's like, well, I looked at your code, kind of parsed around a little bit. This is pretty close. I can't promise it's going to be exactly right. You're probably going to have to tweak it from here. But this is a really good starting point, and that was that was something that people used a lot. Um, yeah. So, and I know that a lot of this you know, successor language tools are are looking to be in that space. I think that's realistic. I think I can look at your C++, and this is pretty close. But please have a test suite because it might be missing some details, or you know, I I in pot, like again because there's no standard build system or build workflow, it's going to be hard even for those tools to really tell you. I promise this builds, or I'll give you the compiler errors to start with, or something. But um, your mileage is going to vary a lot. So if some code base already has a mono repo or something, it might be easier than others. I don't know. Anyway, that was a good question, though. But uh, do, you have, do you have a question? Yep. That's fine. So Brent, thanks for the talk. I think it was a really good talk and you identified a critical gap that people are not seeing in the successor language space. And I hope that this brings more um, more awareness to it and more work on it in particular. Um, I was curious, so one of, or a couple of the techniques that the Carbon Project has been talking about um, in order to address this is one is the idea that you can insert a carbon source into a pre-existing C++ code base, and it can include C++ headers, and it can be included by C++ uh, files like above the chain. Um, so that's like one of their migration story intents. And the other one is the idea of building tooling that will mass convert existing C++ code into carbon code. And I wonder if you could opine on, on those strategies. Pardon me. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Well, disclaimer up front is Carbon's a project still in progress, and clearly my experience with it has been limited because it's still very much progress. And to some degree, it's kind of pitched as a research language. So like, they're not promising it'll actually get somewhere production. Like, they're hoping it gets there, but this, they're not. They're definitely not promising that, right? So everyone take that with a, all this with a grain of salt, big grain of salt, like five grains. Um, I think, they are, I like what they're doing. Um, it's part, it kind of inspired partly this talk is because I'm like, I see how they're wanting to go in the direction of interop being really important. In fact, if you go watch Chandler's talk, the word interop comes up a lot or interoperability. And, and they're planning around that. I think that's really healthy. Um, a lot of the carbon project features aren't features as more, as more as much as design goals at this phase. So it's really hard to be too particular about that. I anticipate that yes, if they can actually convert code in a very in a fairly automated way, they might get way above the 80% mark I was talking about with the CMake adoption thing. It might be more like an 80, 95 or 99%. I still think there's going to be a really long tail. Um, in particular, I think there's going to be a long tail around the preprocessor. And that's something I didn't get into on this talk because it's a lot more complicated. Um, but it'd be it's great hall hallway talk. But you might be surprised to know that your headers are not code so much as they are more like templates. They're not like, 
And what, what I mean by that is your headers are kind of instantiated at the site they're included. They're not really static code. So your header doesn't mean anything except for where it's included, whether that's directly in your CPP file or transitively through another header. And what your header parses as depends on a lot, all that context. And this is very relevant. I have a colleague, Daniel Russo, is gonna be doing a talk about something called mod, he, importable header modules, right? And that's something that's in the C++ standard for C++ 20, and it is not implemented anywhere, um, partly because of these concerns, which is okay, I want it, because it's such a paradigm shift to say, okay, I'm gonna build the header separately, and then you're gonna use that parse all these places. And, but the problem is if you include the header in different ways and different source files, you actually fundamentally have different parses of the same header in different contexts. And your compiler does a lot of work and sometimes doesn't to like help smooth it out for you. And so people mostly don't notice or if they do notice it, they fix it. So it like builds kind of, you end up with kind of some version of a portability, but within CPP files for a header file. I guess I'm concerned about that. So like at absurdum, you could say I have a pound defined class struct somewhere in my header file, right? Like, or I, like, like an A header file, and then the things that include it after it get parsed very differently, depending on what was included first and what order, right? And so, you know, it depends on the compiler and that sort of thing. But like visibility of things change and all kinds of stuff, right? So that you're like, well, who does that? Well, the answer is enough that it comes up in big code bases pretty consistently, right? So those things aren't gonna magically get weeded out. And it's, it's kind of like the point I said about like adopting your build system so I can adopt your language. Like if I need to clean up all the incoherent inclusions in a code base in order to start adopting carbon at velocity, that's a pretty big adoption hurdle, even if it seems like a very small niche problem. I do know Google, I'm pretty sure Google, and I do know other code bases are very uh, eager adopters of like pre-compiled headers, which is similar but not quite the same thing. Um, so they, they, they have a certain amount of governance to try to like, weed out these kinds of definition and consistencies. Um, but I think the, I, okay, so to throw, throw some bombs out there to help people talk about it. I've, 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 I think there's something called definition safety, which is the idea that when you define something, it actually means something no matter what the context you're in. And I think C++ and C don't have that. Um, and I don't think you can solve it by just rewriting to a new language. You have to kind of clean up the C and C++ code and then like it'll be easier to automate it. So, um, and it's really, really, really common in C code. It's very common in C code. Like if you're on this architecture, this is the data structure. If you're on this architecture, this is the other data structure. And maybe both architectures are in the same code base. And so like, how is this, how, how do you parse this header? And the answer is, well, you parse it eight ways in this code base. And that's probably why importable header modules, modules are hard to do. Cause it's like, okay, well, I have one identifier, which is foobar.h, but I have eight parses. And which parse did you want? Which parse did you want? And you know, it's not great for end users, but you know, that was a little bit of a rambly answer. Uh, I think mostly, like I said, I think there's, I, I think that we have really good, they have really good engineers. I think they can get to a 95% like conversion experience. I think that other 5% might actually be more expensive than we think, given the size of these graphs, like I was showing us in these charts and stuff. Um, so I think something that can account for that is gonna be, have a, a bit more velocity than something that can't. More complicated. Uh, Google has a livid head model, um, yes. and so as soon as we submit something, right. uh, and if it's break, if it's breaking, right, the the end users, like the people that have dependencies on whatever we've just changed, or even if we've changed something in their code base, but you know, they they break immediately, uh, which makes the the conversion issue a lot harder because you can't like send out like small, like all of your every single change that we send out when we do a large scale change like this needs to be correct in and of its own right, like, and so if you're trying to transition to a syntax that C++ doesn't understand, right. uh, because it's carbon syntax, your file's not gonna compile anymore, and you're gonna have a million rollback requests. So I, I don't know, I wish Titus were here. Yeah, well, I'll, I'm sure we'll catch up about this. Um, yeah, I think another way to explain, uh, that's a good point. So in, in a monorepo setup, usually, and I think Google mostly fits this category, you have a fairly consistent way to install headers into your source repository. So there's a certain category of problem you don't even have. like. Where is foobar.h? Well, it's in, it includes foobar.h. It's, you know, and, and you don't have to worry about, are there more than one foobar.h's with different symlinks based on which dash i flags ended up first in your compiler command on different parts of the code base, because it's all pretty consistent. But in realistic code bases, it looks like, well, I built that thing yesterday, and then I run an apt-get install, or apt-get up, 
up, app get update, and now there's a slightly different version of the header. Now, it might be a very ABI compatible, but it's different. So if you're, so your your transpiler thing might be like emitting very like different, you know, sec new language syntax depending on what day of the week you were like running your your transformation engine thing, right? So that's where things like having kinds of CI systems where you can detect that like that other language broke because you changed your header or you included this other thing in a different order. It gets to be interesting. Again, it's probably an edge case, but at the scale we're talking about, it doesn't take like two or three percent of problems to really like scum up the whole works, right? So um, this is like, we do this all the time. We, we have this problem all the time for things that aren't supposed to be breaking changes, like, uh, like migrating to a new C++ standard or picking a new compiler that basically didn't break anything. And at the scale we're at, it's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of projects that need to get updated. And, you know, we pay the price for it, but um, we also kind of have a little bit head model, but it's, uh, the project structure's not the same, so. It makes um, it really hard, like, if you're gonna convert from C++ to Carbon, you need to have an entirely correct transformation that you commit atomically at one time in one CL, because you can't mix and match, right? Because the C++ compiler won't understand the Carbon syntax. I think what's interesting about the Carbon model, if I understand it correctly, is they're trying to use the same AST. So they're trying to use the same Clang, like, I don't know if it's Clang based exactly, I think it is, like the same like abstract parse of the code. So that presumes, again, to my point about headers, it presumes there is a parse to the code, like a parse and not five parses that you need to negotiate around, right? But um, it might avoid some problems with, is the header file in sync with the, is the .h file, .hxx file in sync with the .carbon file, whatever their extension is, right? Um, or maybe you don't need both. But um, again, it's like, it really helps to have the coherent, you know, integration build that is libit head or whatever. Um, and so in other cases, you're gonna have to do a gradual adoption. That would look like, okay, I'm shipping both APIs for a certain number of years, and then while my clients are on the new API, I'm gonna get rid of the old API. And that's, again, that's one of Titus's principles back from one of the slides I was quoting, is like, okay, realistically, that's gonna happen a lot. Like, I'm shifting my library, it's foundational, you all use it, it's got the new syntax if you're in this language, and it has the old syntax if you're in this language, and it's gonna be like three years, five years, 10 years, three major versions, some, ver some amount of overlap, and something needs to keep them consistent because if you wanna link all these things together, the linkage has to make sense. And so there's like, it doesn't matter what you're, I guess another way to think about all this is if you only approach this problem from coherent abstract syntax trees of, of particular parts of your code base, particular CPP files or libraries, right? And you're not thinking about how all those syntax trees interact. If you can't merge those into one giant syntax tree for your project, you're gonna have problems. And C++, C++ don't provide that guarantee. So you have to somehow on top of that kind of solve those problems for the most smooth adoption. And any language that assumes that, like assumes you already have C++ modules, assumes you already have pretty close to pre-compiled headers or something like that, is gonna have a lot of, is gonna have some adoption hurdles at scale in a messy place like GitHub, right? Something like that. We get a question in the back. Yeah. So when it comes to the current set of successor languages and, and you're, you're um, um, evaluating them on how well you can take one of those middle nodes and upgrade them to that language, you wanna give them like a letter grade, which ones are doing all right, or you know, which ones fail completely? Yeah, um, I, I still, again, I'm still very much in a wait and see mode and I'm more wanting to make sure I jump in early enough in the conversation that like we can actually factor these into the development of these things, right? Um, it's worth noting that some of the successor languages themselves, if you ask the developers, they are not successor languages. So they ask the Rust engineers, like, are you trying to display C++? I'm like, well, if it works for you, but we're not necessarily trying to do that, right? Uh, if you ask the carbon, if you ask, well, I think carbon, they literally use the word successor, but like I said, maybe it means more like alternative depending on what, and some, not, I could talk to Chandler or Titus or somebody about someday, what they really mean by that. Um, CPP2 and uh, is actually not like a successor language. Herb, Herb Sutter is being very clear that he wants a new C++ syntax. So he wants this to be C++. He's not looking for, a, you know, he's looking for a new thing, but he's looking at for with it, within the context of what is C++. Um, I, Interestingly, I uh, see Val, for example, I think, I guess they consider themselves a uh, C++, they, I think they're branding themselves more as a research project for now about value semantics. So I think it's fair to say like, maybe someday if, if it gets some steam, they would like to have a design principle interop. Um, if they get to that point, 
hopefully some of these things factor into the conversation about like, okay, well, where's the, does, does CMake have a vowel on the languages list, that sort of thing. Um, I think there's a talk about um, Swift at the C++ now coming up, and it's actually in the title, Swift is a successor language of some sort. Um, there is a certain amount of interrupt there, right? Because you can, at least if you're using certain compilers on certain platforms, you could just be like, okay, I'm gonna rewrite this C code, and now it's, you know, it's now Swift code. And so it's worth noting though that at least with the support service that's currently existing, it's not like you're gonna be using Swift everywhere with the same level of productivity or support that you're gonna get everywhere else. So um, anyway, these, these are off the cuff. It's probably not fair. I'm sure there are very spe specific corrections people would like to make. I would be more than willing to hear them make the corrections because at least we're talking about these subjects a little bit more. Um, I would say that uh, the ones that want to, or I guess we could throw a circle in the mix. Again, if you ask Sean Baxter, it's not in, he's not trying to make a new language, he's trying to iterate on C++. So the ones that seem to say like, I don't want a new language, I think they kind of get it, and that may be in these terms, but they're kind of trying to say, well, worst case scenario, transpile it, your build system can figure out, figure it out, and then you're fine, right? Um, and we do that all the time, don't we? Because we all shift our C and C++ to protobuf or something, right? That's a different language, really. Um, and, and that's kind of an understood problem. So anything that kind of leans into that space is probably a little out of the curve, but um, it's some of, the, some of the concerns don't apply in those cases, like I said, about like developer experience. If you right click on go to definition on a function that comes from a protobuf type, does it go to your protobuf line? Does it go to the code generated out of the protobuf? Like end users, this is a real practical problem for people trying to learn a new language and approach a project in a real practical way. Some, the answer is like neither one's really right, but we don't have tools to really help you negotiate that. Um, but uh, I think again, if we start talking about polyglot ecosystems, some of these problems will start being a little more solvable. So um, I'm kind of arguing against people saying, I'm not arguing against. I'm trying to point out that when people say language, I like this language, I like that language, they actually mean a lot more than the syntax. They mean a lot more than like the for loops and the if statements. They also a lot of times mean the things that go along with it. And that's okay, but it does make it hard to discuss these things. Um, and so maybe if we make everything easier to support by making everything a little more standardized, then uh, we can move beyond those issues and start literally just talking about syntax. And, you know, sometimes it is nicer to use a functional syntax for, like people, like some people like functional core, procedural, like what's the other way around? Procedural core, functional application or something like that, right? Like, yeah, well, it'd be nice if you had languages that did that and you could just, you know, hard to shoot yourself in the foot at this layer, but if you, you know, need to open up the, the safety hatches on the bot bottom layer, go for it, right? So, um, all right, any more questions, concerns? Feel free to feel free to let me know let me know what you really think after this because I'm going to give this talk again, including in front of people that might be like very vested because they're designing these languages. So I'll feel free to let me know um, what else you think. All right, I'll throw one out. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, so like three different approaches of uh, how to like move C++ forward that we've been hearing about. Uh, right. I guess we've got successor languages like replace it. It's broken. <laughs> um, or like move past it, it's broken. We've got right. uh, Sean's model, which was essentially like incremental adding of like features and bubbles of code. Right, right. And we've got think very carefully about what to do and then do nothing. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, but like yeah. I guess general uh, like existing ISO development model, which with right. the understanding you don't want to like throw too much in favor of any one of them. Is there any of these approaches you empathize most with? Yeah, I think. Um, I think it's clear to me, and hopefully I'm convincing to you all, that the status quo isn't I, satisfactory anymore. Can I just, I, so I feel like right. there's a lot of, like, right. we all know who Sean is, but not right. every, well, like, Did we I just all, say Sean? Did we I just keep it? saying Sean. Sean Baxter. And so we should probably explain to people that haven't been coming to every single one of those yeah. meetings. Yeah, okay, I'll explain it. Yeah, Sean Baxter is the creator and, main, and, and, and muscle behind the Circle Project, which is an ex I guess you call it an experimental C++ compiler that adds a lot of extensions. And you can find it, it's pretty easy to Google for circle lang or circle compiler and you'll find it. Um, he was, he gave the talk here last month. Um, so you can go check out the NYCPP YouTube channel and you can see a talk about some kinds of things he's talking about, including things that are relevant in the space about how maybe we should have very specific feature toggles to do very specific changes instead of like, oh, a whole new syntax. Instead it's like, well, maybe this file can, can add this feature and remove these features at the file level. So when I talk about bubbles of code, 
that's what I'm talking about is like Sean saying like, oh, what you really want is you want to go to this file and say, um, oh, you can't do the most vexing parse anymore, so that's not a problem in this code, right? The other code, maybe it still uses it, but for this code, I don't have that problem, so you don't even have to think about it. So like, or like lower your cognitive load and that sort of thing. Other people don't agree with that approach, as, as Dan's pointing out. Um, they, you know, for different reasons, I don't, at the risk of summarizing someone else's thoughts, I think it's a lot about like how complicated that would be, you know, that would, that would confuse end users, that sort of thing. Um, whether all the interactions of all the different on and off switches that go sideways, pear shape really fast and confuse and break things, and make it impossible to support, I don't know. Um, it's a good question. Those are good concerns. I think engineering work can sort some of those out. Um, to the question about like different approaches, I think um, I think it's clear the status quo needs iterated on. I, I think it's pretty easy to get consensus in any room about yeah we should we can do a lot better and we should. I think the so I, I wouldn't be satisfied with everything's fine. Let's keep going the way we're going. I think that's clear. Uh, I think. Given these principles, things that, that it's, it's easier to fit into the existing build systems where in, a, in an approach where you're either converting into C++ or you're editing, you're, all, the work, all the tool chains are required to add, support the new thing together. Um, it's worth noting, and that's a problem with Rust too, actually Rust and maybe the Carbon project just to start out with is they're both kind of targeting the LLVM tool chain, which is actually really portable, but it's not everywhere. And a lot of code bases could be using it and aren't yet, right? So again, if you wanted to adopt one of those, first you have to convert to LLVM tool chains, and then you can adopt it. It's like, okay, well, that's complicated. Um, that's two migrations, right? So I think the ones that try to stay in place will have easier adoption velocity. I don't, I can't speak to whether organizationally or politically they'll actually work that way. Um, I think, I, I suspect that people are underestimating how how much more valuable it is to be able to, again, like more gradually in very small ways update your code base and remove problems you don't have, want to have anymore. Um, it doesn't get you to, I think a lot of, some of the criticisms are specifically around safety and that you need a very strong type system or strong ownership model like that ties everywhere in very comprehensive ways to make certain kinds of guarantees. And I think this is a really good point. I also think, if you can't tell from my slides, that it doesn't matter if you can't adopt it. So um, I think we kind of need to do both, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like, fine, let's do more you know, coherent, provable safety, whatever. But in the, in the intervening decades, plural, um, we absolutely need to get the C, the, the C we have already in production better. And we need the C++ we have already in production better. So anyone that says, forget about it, let's just start over, I think is being unrealistic, at least in the time horizon of our careers. Um, we're gonna be, you know, talking about the good old days when we were using 64-bit CPUs and there wasn't AI or something, by the time we actually get to the point, that point, right? Um, so, so like, by the time we get that, that's where we're gonna be, it's gonna be like that by the time we get to that point. So I think the more um, vociferously someone is advocating that C++ needs to be deprecated right now, the more they should be invested in making sure C++ is replaceable. And, the, and again, like as you pointed out, there's a lot of tooling around that and there's a lot of standardizing of projects around that. And I don't think, I think that's in a lot of ways the shortest path, even though it sounds pretty indirect. So if people are saying, going to the NSA and asking for piles of money about hardening this or that or the other, rewriting it into Rust projects will work for some things, it will be exhausted and then there'll be everything else and it'll still be just as insecure as it was a decade before because you didn't even start on those project problems. So the day one problem is, make sure we can do these kinds of migrations the way we want to. And then we can start talking about, okay, well, now that I can rewrite any project in any language I want, what's the language this project should be in now, right? And, and that's kind of where I'm at. So whether that's like, you know, again, like it's very likely that given all that, maybe the future of C++ is something, isn't C++, at least not the way we understand it today, but it's called C++, right? Uh, but all that legacy code's still still there, and legacy may, and sometimes isn't even the right word. It's just, you know, important and, and used in so many places. It's hard to drop support, you know, that kind of thing. So, all right, thanks, y'all. Thank you, Brett. Yes. Last thing, uh, we have a website. If you haven't been there. There's a link and uh, some information about how to support us, um, both in terms of like 
if any of you work for companies that would want to host us or sponsor us, uh, we are set up to accept support. And I want to especially note, uh, we introduced recently like a community tier of support. Uh, so just like $5 a month if you're here every month and enjoy it and want to just throw something smaller away. We really appreciate it. Um, but if not, keep coming back anyway. Um, and next month, we're going to be hosting at LSEG. Uh, Inbal Levy is going to be speaking. I'm really excited for that. And it's going to be like a huge space. So like tell your friends and coworkers about uh, like this meetup and, you know, bring folks. And yeah, really excited to just keep this going and see you all next month. Thanks so much.